Hey guys, I realized that uh, there was a step prior to a lot of the things I said in Caesarean rhetoric and Periclean rhetoric. I neglected to define the framework within which I'm working when I talk about rhetoric. And that's not helpful to anyone, so here goes. I'm working within the framework of Aristotelian rhetoric and the definition which he uses. Uh, I've only listed two sources because I'm counting my secondary source as Plato's Gorgias, um, which we are all familiar with, and in that we know that he does not give a favorable treatment of rhetoric, nor does he speak of it in a way that uh, sees it as useful or helpful in public life, because his aim is to obviously institute his republic, which is not the same kind of polis that uh, Aristotle might have instituted. Uh, but that's another, another video entirely. Uh, so the primary source is Aristotle's Rhetoric and Poetics. I'm using a Random House edition from 1954. And then I'm citing uh, the abstract and the first page of a Rhetorical Appeals journal article, uh, which establishes the idea that rhetoric is not only Aristotelian. There might be some wiggle room in how we define rhetoric, although the foundation for such is still Aristotelian. Uh, so those are some things to consider as we move forward. So the first thing to consider is what is rhetoric from the Aristotelian perspective. And the simple definition right away is just, quote, the ability to observe the available means of persuasion in any given situation, unquote. And he says there are two types of means. There are means that are proper to the discipline of rhetoric itself, and then there are means that are outside of the discipline of rhetoric, uh, which he discusses a lot in his book, but we're not going to be discussing those today. We are mainly talking about the three appeals, logos, pathos, and ethos. Um, and all three of those in English, logos is the appeal to the system of an argument or the ability to prove a certain truth. Ethos is an appeal to the person's perceived sense of ethics or morality. And pathos is an appeal to the hearer's emotions, an attempt to stir them up. So those are the three things that are traditionally talked about. And what's interesting about this is that it, it's still a, a, a partial syllogism. It's still a partial syllogistic Enthymeme is the word he uses. Uh, the enthymeme is a partial syllogism, not a full logical syllogism like you might see a scholastic using or something of that degree. Uh, nevertheless, there is still reasoning going on in rhetoric. It's not as simple as the way Plato refers to it as a knack or as a way to help you lie, even though those things are true. And he does have a point there that there are certain aspects of rhetoric that are not helpful, that can be very damaging. Uh, so, what is it not? Well, a couple things come to mind. Rhetoric cannot be mere bombast or a passionate assertion. Uh, that might work if your audience respects that. But obviously not all audiences respect passionate assertions with no grounding. Not all audiences respect uh, bombastic style and loud voices and um, brutal gesticulation and the moving of the arms. You know, the kind of stuff you see coming out of Germany in the 1930s. Not everybody respects that. Uh, so it's not merely that. It's not merely... Uh, an artifice of style. There is actually a systematic approach. And that, that is clearly seen in the fact that you, you're appealing to something when you're using rhetoric. You're either appealing to ethos, pathos, or logos. Another way to think about that is that the speaker is not speaking on his own authority. He's, he's most communicative when he's putting himself underneath an authority. Even though he's referring to his own ethics or perceived um, possession of such, um, an assumption prior to that 
appeal is that ethics is something worth appealing to. That could be seen as an authority outside of oneself. Pathos, that authority is your audience. You believe that they are worth speaking to, that their emotions are worth appealing to. Uh, and then in Logos, you're appealing to the idea that there is some sort of truth that everyone can commit to. So there's all of these higher authorities that people are appealing to when they use rhetoric, and that in itself makes it not mere bombast or passionate assertion, uh, but somewhat systematic. And uh, we've been thinking about that all the way from Aristotelian times to the present day, and that essentially is my positive perspective for today. There's a quote that I really need to go ahead and just pull up and read. <clears throat> this is more of a paraphrase, not a quote. Rhetoric is more than the mere appeals to logos, pathos, or ethos. In fact, there may be more, and the appeals that do exist may need to be rephrased in a new way. Uh, that is a very interesting idea because I hope that that will inform the way we look at the videos I've already done on Pericles and on Caesar, especially Caesar. You know, you could say that he's just appealing to ethos through his uh, care for the Roman people. You could say that he's just appealing to logos by using the historical narrative voice. You could say that he's appealing to pathos when he when he uh, refers to all the people falling before him in tears and how he, the great ruler, uses mercy and has mercy on their transgressions. But there seems to be more to it than that, or a better way of phrasing it. And all of that, I think, summarizes in the fact that when we look at our world today, how many times do we see people doing that, caring enough about their audience to say something and try to convince them, honestly, to honestly try to convince them. Instead, what we see often, uh, oftentimes are the echo chambers and the bastions of either liberal or conservative thought, and that's all that there really seems to be. I really believe rhetoric flies in the face of that because it respects the audience enough to come down to where they are at, and I, I even hate that terminology, to uh, go outside the city, so to speak, to go outside your city and meet them in their city, or perhaps in a common ground in between the two cities. Uh, that's, a, that's a better metaphor than going down from your own mountain to speak to them down on the ground. Uh, so that's my positive perspective on rhetoric. Hopefully that clarifies what rhetoric is, not only from the Aristotelian perspective, but where rhetoric could go definitionally, uh, and how we can analyze these, uh, these great rulers and kings and warriors of the past and get an idea of what they're appealing to. What do they put themselves underneath authoritatively and then use to garner their audience's attention? So I hope this was helpful, and I hope it was, in fact, a positive perspective. Thank you for listening.